Hello everyone. Today's topic is an easy one and I thought that what we could do is basically have a conversation back and forth and you know you can give me some of the suggestions you have about how to protect your home from damage as well as you know I'll be bouncing ideas off of you as well of things I've done over the last 20 years of being in the hobby. Now uh, I should start this off and say that my name is Mark, uh, Mark, ne Mark Levinson and I run Milosreef.com. So, all right, did that. I've been told I need to be doing that, so I'm doing it. I, uh, the reef is waking up. First light's already switched. You're probably going to see one turn off here in a little bit. Um, we have sound. Thank you very much. I appreciate that information. I have my chat window down here, down below. I will literally try to keep up with conversations today. Last week, I just talked and talked and talked and barely looked down. And I apologize if I didn't answer your questions, but it was one of those topics that was really important, and I just didn't want to get derailed with uh, random questions. <laughs> and it's not wrong to ask the questions, and sometimes people will answer you in the chat, so it's not like you're being completely ignored. I just may not be the one to answer you that time. But I do go back and I reread the chat afterwards, and sometimes I have this inclination that I'll screen grab that and I will address it in a future uh, follow-up video, and it just comes down to how much time I have available. Today's chat is specifically gonna be about wear and tear on your home and what your aquarium does to it, or how you can protect your home from damage from running a reef tank in your domicile. So, I mean, the, the information would also apply for a business, but a lot of us tend to have tanks in our homes, whether it's our bedroom or our living room, possibly your kitchen, uh, the den, the basement, um, not too many attic tanks that I'm aware of. But I wanted to emphasize that these ecosystems are, you know, they're full of water, which creates condensation in your home. They're full of salt, which causes erosion. And there are going to be things that you'll either have to replace on a regular basis, or you need to protect it up front before uh, the damage can even be caused. So let's talk about something very simple. Uh, you've got your aquarium and you're putting it up against a wall. Now, the wall itself could be sheetrock or it could be some type of uh, wood paneling. Um, typically, it's some one of those type of choices. Uh, there could be wallpaper, which if it's a glossy wallpaper designed for um, a more wet environment, it'd probably handle up just fine, and it, you could probably just wipe it down with a sponge from time to time. But sheetrock, as it gets wet, or even as spatters hitting it, and the moisture gets inside of it through the paint job, you'll see the paint bubbling off the wall and you want to be able to protect your system from that type of damage. So, for example, what I've done in the past is I've put protective, uh, the stuff you put in the bottom of drawers or in the bottom of cabinets, they have some that's sticky, and you can actually stick it to the wall on that area exactly behind the tank. You could affix a large piece of acrylic you know, with a couple of small screws to protect it. Um, some kind of a plastic that will prevent the moisture from hitting the sheetrock, but completely invisible from the front of the tank. You don't want something that's really obvious and glaring and shiny and glossy, but you do want something that you can wipe off easily. And maybe some kind of clear, that's the word I'm looking for, contact paper, could be applied to the general area where you know moisture is very likely to happen. If you're running an external overflow box or external filtration, or you're hanging a skimmer on the back of your tank, Eventually, your skimmer is going to go a little crazy, and it's going to sputter crap off the top. And those little bubbles popping on the collection cup are going to spatter the wall, and the wall is going to begin to deal with the damage that is likely to ensue. So if you can protect that area with something, so that way when you are moving the tank later or moving out, you don't have this giant wall that you have to fix. So that would be the first step. Find a way to protect your wall. Um, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a type of material, I think it's called FRP, that Home Depot sells, and uh, Lowe's and different places like that, and they, a, a lot of times you'll see what looks like, a, it's sort of similar to whiteboard, some of it looks more like the skin of an orange, and it's a, a thin, hard plastic that can be mounted to the wall, you can be glued to the wall, screwed to the wall, you'll have a few screw holes to cover up later on. But it's a lot easier to patch tiny little holes than it is to retexture the wall so it looks like nothing ever happened there before. Uh, so I just want to throw that out there as the first thing. 
If you can cover an external overflow box so that the water inside doesn't sputter out, that would be great. You can't really cover your skimmer because your skimmer is designed to breathe. And so you can't cover up like the holes on the top where it would likely bubble out. That's why it's best to protect that wall behind the tank. Uh, I did once have my 29 gallon across the room and there's a huge mirror over there, which maybe you can see, no, you can't, but there's a mirror over there. And surprisingly, some of the salt creep ate away the bottom of the mirror. You know, on the back side of the mirror, the foil has been damaged. And at this point, the only solution is either remove the mirror or put a really wide frame around the mirror to hide it and make it look new again. And that's one of those things I've been thinking about doing for 10 years and I still have to this day have not done. It's just not a critical thing in my life, but I bet once I do it, I'm like, oh, that looks so much better. I should have done that 10 years ago. <laughs> All right, um, yeah, FRP. That's what Jonas is just pointing out. Uh, it's a fiberglass based stuff. So you can cut that easily and apply it behind the aquarium. Uh, the floor itself is another matter and that is gonna involve some planning. And when you're, typically our aquariums are in a living space and very often our living space has uh, carpeting down on the floor and carpets absorb liquid. So if you're doing water changes around your aquarium or you spill a bucket or you're just taking things in and out of the tank, can you protect the carpet that's right here in the front of the tank with something? Now your first inclination would probably be, let me put down towels and that will protect my carpet. And two times a year, you can hire a company to come in and really deep clean the carpets and get them back to like new condition, which is always nice. And I actually love doing that. But I actually have a piece of clear runner. I'm gonna go get it. I just bought this yesterday actually at Home Depot. I haven't installed it yet, but let's see. So I got this stuff here and I'm just going to put it right along the front of the tank. And the reason I do that is because this is the entryway to the front of my home and everyone walks in and they track in everything from the yard. So if they didn't walk up the driveway, but they walked across the grass and the dirt, they're going to bring that stuff on my carpet and ruin this part of the carpet right here in the front. So I always have this clear plastic on here and I've had plastic on this floor um, for a long time. It's probably been, I probably bought the piece three years ago, I guess, whenever I put the new carpet in. So four years ago. And then, you know, from time to time, depending on the time of year, the weather conditions, whether anyone's coming over, I'll remove it, you know, and I'll vacuum and I leave it off because it looks nice and it's quiet. And there's no weird bright white reflection off the plastic. But for the most part, I like it there because when I come from over here, which is the doorway to my fish room, I'm carrying a skimmer collection cup. I'm carrying fish food across the front to feed the fish in that room. You know, there's all this back and forth and you know, protecting this area of the carpet is important to me. Had I been a really smart guy, I would have put ceramic tile in this one area. And I've considered it, again, a, a lot of times. And I didn't buy enough of the ceramic tile installed in the kitchen and in the foyer. I didn't buy enough to do this part here. And so I can't find that anymore, it's too long ago. So if I ever do a remodel, I will very likely replace all the flooring through this area with something continuous and hopefully it'll look amazing and it'll handle moisture. So I'm, I'm thinking of some type of hardwood flooring possibly that has been sealed and that I can easily sweep and mop and keep clean and then have the carpet or maybe an area rug uh, for the living space. And that way I don't have to quite worry about it. Now, that being said, some of you probably have hardwood floors. And when you drip salt water onto hardwood floors, it leaves stains and spots and, and do, does some damage. So you have to stay on top of cleaning it. And I remember I went to one guy's house, he had a 120 gallon reef, and he always had a pile of towels on the floor right by the tank because he was constantly dripping. And he would grab one with his foot and just rub it across the floor and kick it back to the side. Wasn't the most visually appealing situation. I mean, you would have thought it was laundry day and it really was just, that was his way of quickly cleaning it up. But I'm sure when he had company over and not just me, he probably was more willing to put that away or throw it in a basket or something like that and keep the floors dry. <laughs> um, how do I know if my fish has AIDS? 
can I transfer AIDS between fish and human? I'm worried about my yellow tang, which is confirmed HIV positive. Most random comment winner of today. All right, so um, it's funny that you say that, and I know you're totally tongue in cheek and you're trying to get a reaction out of the audience. But the bottom line is, I have always joked that I don't want to get AIDS into my tank, and so you know I always quarantine my fish and I put them through safety stop because I don't want any kind of ick or velvet or anything like that to get in my tank. Uh, I would love to know what vet was able to identify AIDS or HIV positive in a fish. That, that sounds hilarious. Anyway, um, okay, so we've talked about the walls, we've talked about the floors, now let's talk about the ceiling. The, uh, for the most part, your ceiling should stay dry unless you do some really crazy stuff accidentally. Typically, if you're pumping water into your tank and the hose flops loose, you might hit the ceiling and then you're just going to have to clean it up as best you can. But there are parts of the ceiling that do get damaged from our aquariums. And part of the damage could be from installing a light fixture. And then you buy a new light fixture and the new one is installed and uh, you have to move. And so now you've put holes in the ceiling. You've put multiple holes and you're creating some wear and tear on your home. So you're going to want to patch that. And they do have different patch kits that you can purchase at uh, Home Depot or Lowe's. Uh, I found one recently that it looks pink when you, ins you, know, when you put it in with a putty knife and it turns white and then you can sand it gently and you can go ahead and touch it up with some paint to match the ceiling and get rid of those holes that you've caused. And so some people are concerned or they choose not to hang their lights because they don't want to deal with two small holes in the ceiling. And I would much rather just recommend just go ahead and hang your light. Just like you hang anything else up in your apartment, you know, let's, because let's say we're talking about rentals and you're thinking, I don't want to ruin the place. Mounting a TV on your wall, hanging pictures on the walls, hanging a poster on the wall, hanging a, a light fixture from the ceiling. These are all things that we do. We're, we are living in our homes and we're decorating our homes. And if your aquarium has a light kit and you want to hang it from the ceiling, just make sure you know how to do it. And there are some nice solutions. I've talked about some in the past. There's this thing that Mine are made of metal and they look like a screw. I mean, they're thick and wide and you push them up against sheetrock, you put it on the end of a drill and it literally just screws right into the sheetrock and you can hang stuff off the sheetrock. I would recommend that you limit how much you're pulling down on the sheetrock. So weigh the light fixture. A lot of the LED fixtures these days seem to be about five, maybe 10 pounds. And in that case, you're talking about five pounds per screw and sheetrock can definitely handle that. If you don't, if you can't find that corkscrew type uh, insert I'm talking about. There's also toggle bolts which install through the ceiling and then afterwards you just remove the screw from the ceiling and spackle it. Touch it up with a little bit of white paint if that's the color of your ceiling and no one would ever know. They would have to really be studying the ceiling to figure it out. Just like they would study the walls to see where you ever hung a picture before. But don't feel like you cannot hang up your light fixture. If your ceiling is crazy high and you can't reach it that's another matter but we're just talking about normal situations here. <clears throat> Now, one of the things that you may discover, especially closer to your aquarium, is that your air conditioner vents may start getting really rusty looking. Uh, they can get stained, they may show uh, uh, spots like mold. That kind of stuff happens because the air in your house is passing through these constantly and the salty air from the aquarium is going through your air conditioner. So I actually just bought um, like eight of these yesterday to replace a lot in my home and those were a couple of the ones that didn't fit. <laughs> I, uh, I was hoping it was the right size, but it turns out the one that I need to replace the most is bigger than all the ones sold at Home Depot. So I've got to do a search and find another one. But replacing those with a new one will make you feel so much better. And you know, I'd, I'd be watching TV and I look up that vent and it looks so horrible. And uh, now that I've replaced a bunch of them, I look around, you know, like that one there looks brand new again. I love it, I'm so happy. And those vents are like 10, $11. It's not a huge expense and it definitely makes the place look newer than, <laughs> than reality. And you know, it, it makes sense. I, I replaced these, I don't know, five, six years ago and it just was time. So I went through the house and I measured a bunch, but I actually measured the actual metal. It turns out you measure the distance of the vent itself. That's what you measure. And I didn't understand that. So this is 14 by six. The actual object is 16 by eight. And so I went there looking for 16 by eights and it uh, turns out they don't have that. So, all right. Uh, what are some things that you are trying to protect from damage? Feel free to chat about it here in the comments and that way we can address them. Uh, it might be things I haven't even thought about. 
but you definitely want to keep track of what's going on. Oh, I've got one I can tell you, and this one was a really sucky one. So if you don't run a dehumidifier in your home, which I actually do, and I try to run it at night. I, I prefer to run it at night. Like right now, if it was on, I would be hearing it run. And it adds heat to the house. And right now, we're in the middle of summer. Today, the temperature is going to be a, almost 100 degrees here in Texas. And because of that, the, uh, the air conditioner has to work really hard against 100 degrees. Well, I don't want to pump hot air out of a dehumidifier into the room as well and make it fight that as well as the outdoor air. So what I'm recommending to you is that you, if you run a dehumidifier, Start it at night, like when you're about to go to bed, and let it run all night long to take humidity out of your, your home for the eight, nine, 10 hours until you get up in the morning. By then it might already be turned off because it might be full, and then you can go ahead and drain it and set it up for the next night. But pulling the humidity out of the air will protect things like, and I know you won't believe this, but it's a true story, stainless steel appliances that actually rust, which makes zero sense to me. And the front of my refrigerator that I bought new a few years ago, within the first year, was rusting. And I wasn't running the dehumidifier. And so I went ahead and uh, I contacted the fridge company and said, you know, I've got a defective fridge. It's rusting. And they said, if you'll read your manual, we do not guarantee that the stainless steel won't rust. Isn't that the whole point of stainless steel, that it can't rust? And I mean, this isn't like I'm throwing aquarium water against it. This is just in a kitchen. I don't know, 15 feet away from my aquarium, and yet I w it was getting all orange, and you could take a, a, a towel and wipe down the front, and the towel would have an orange handprint you know, for me pressing and rubbing. And I just was like, I can't believe it. So I went ahead, and I went to uh, Home Depot. I talked to the girl in the paint department, and she said, you need to use this stuff. And uh, Naval Jelly. I think that's what it was called. So I get a paintbrush, I, I pour the stuff into a pan or a, a bowl of some kind so I can brush it on the fridge, and I'm reading the bottle. You know, <laughs> I'm on autopilot. She says, use this stuff, so I just start using it. And I'm reading the bottle, and it says, do not use on stainless steel. <laughs> I'm just like, oh my god. So I wipe it all down as quickly as I can, thinking, this girl almost ruined my fridge, which is already rusting. And uh, it turned out that it, it actually worked. And I just, I, I don't know why there's a warning on the front. I don't know what they don't want you to use it on, but it was on the package. And what it did, what, what, the reason I found it that it works is on the front of my fridge is the ice maker where you can get a drink of water and you can fill up a glass of ice cubes. And where I didn't get all the jelly off, that part of the stainless steel became perfect. I mean, it just looked like brand new day one. I was like, oh, so about a month ago or so, I went ahead and I brushed a whole bunch on the front of the fridge and let it sit there for about 30 minutes. And then I took, you know, some old t-shirts and polished it all off. And that helped bring it up to look better. Actually, I feel like if I just did that exact process, maybe once a week for four weeks in a row, I could get the fridge back to normal. My ideal choice, but I'll never do it, is to turn off the fridge, remove the doors and put them up on sawhorses where I can just apply this stuff really thick and let it sit like overnight and then clean it off. But I'm never gonna do that. My, my process is more like trying to clean a shower. Spray it down, let it sit, clean it off, and uh, reduce the, the, the filth. <laughs> so uh, there is one thing I can tell you about stainless steel appliances that you may not know unless you worked in fast food, and that they always apply a lemon oil on top of the stainless steel. And the weird thing is, I can't find lemon oil at Walmart or at the supermarket. It's, it's weird. I found a small bottle of it on Amazon, and it was really expensive, and lemon oil should be dirt cheap. And I, uh, you can just apply that to a rag, and then you can just wipe down all the stainless steel appliances, and it'll protect it from damage. So, and lemon oil is completely safe for, uh, for uh, food prep. So you know they're using it on all the, the stainless steel surfaces when they're making your burgers and fries. So don't fear it. Uh, you can use it anywhere. It's not going to affect your children. It's not going to affect your pets. And uh, a little bit goes a long way. You know, I mean, you're basically just coating the entire surface with lemon oil. So if you start doing that, that will also help with the wear and tear that an aquarium could do to your appliances in your kitchen. All right, let me see what I've missed. Uh, I see a question asking if I would donate a sump. No, sorry.
Uh, Mateus is saying that his AC was damaged from the humidity of the room and destroyed the inner fan. I see someone that finally made it to the live stream. Mr. Reefbuster, welcome. Uh, Mike B points out that not all stainless steel is the same. I agree, but for example, uh, the stainless steel screws on mag pumps rust. And you know, a lot of us use mag pumps. And I've actually removed the screws that they uh, used and bought new ones at Home Depot that were the same size and put them in and they lasted longer. So, you know, it's not like Home Depot has different grades of stainless steel. I mean, basically you get a stainless steel screw or you get a regular zinc screw or uh, iron or steel. These are the choices you have. They don't, I've never seen an option to get a better version. So what we do is we just use what we can get our hands on. So that is something that I would recommend. I'm looking at the lighting of the tank and it's, this, this end looks better than this end because this was getting blasted and you can't adjust the light intensity on YouTube. Um, Roberto asks if I use Ketomorpha or Calerpa and my refugium has got Feather Calerpa in it right now. <laughs> All right, Daisy. He asks, what's a Dickie's barbecue cup for on the side of your stand? Well, because I'm a procrastinator and I'm the king of solutions. So we will turn this slightly here. So there is a pipe right down here that is my drain that goes to the refugium. And for some reason, this spot right here started to drip. So I took a little tiny bungee cord and I put a cup under there to catch the drip. And that was my solution. It's a, it's a weird thing. It only drips when it feels like it. It's not a regular drips all the time situation. The cup is completely bone dry right now. But then, you know, a month ago, I had this much water in the cup. I basically have to replace that connection, which means remove all the plumbing going down and replace it with brand new. And it's a project I don't feel like doing right now. So I have a Dickies cup there. That's my solution. Ah, uh, thank you for the shirt. So this shirt was from a friend of mine. Um, she runs Maui Diving. So it's on the back here. And it has an octopus and a squid. And I was like, this thing is awesome. And so I decided to wear it. So if you're going to go scuba diving in Hawaii, you should go to Maui Diving. I do not have an octopus, uh, Mr. Crook. But um, my dad did when I was a kid. And he had a little small one, and we would feed it goldfish. But that was a long time ago. Uh, if I wanted to run an octopus at this point, I would have to have a tank that is completely sealed because they are escape artists. And so you have to plan ahead so that the octopus doesn't end up out of the tank and possibly perishing. I could have sworn I answered this question last week, Matthias. Matthias, um, you asked about edge prep. you're going to want to use a jointer. And I gave you a link with a whole lot of information in last week's video. Um, if you can go to milosreef.com and then find the articles and then go to acrylics or maybe go to tools, those categories, acrylics and tools both show everything I use other than Minion. That's not been added to the website because it's kind of a big deal. But uh, all the tools I always used when I was working with acrylic was, uh, is in that article and you're just gonna run your new acrylic across the jointer to get the edge perfectly smooth so there's no saw edges. Daily Reefing asks, what is your long-term thoughts on the ReefBrite XHOs? I literally love them. And uh, you can't tell that they're on right now, but they are phenomenal. So right now they're adding light on this end of the tank because this metal halide hasn't turned on yet. And the, uh, it adds that blue, but at night when all the metal halides are off and this tank is just glowing with XHOs, all these oranges are phenomenal. The greens are popping. The tank looks amazing every night. And I love that I can have them really high up off the water. My XHOs are way, way up here. I don't have them down low on the tank. And so they don't get dirty. They don't get salt creep on them. And I can actually pivot them slightly because of the way they mount. 
so I can tilt. I actually am coming in to the, you know, if this was the reef this direction, I've got the lights coming in this direction instead of just pointing straight down. So that way it's kind of hitting the middle of the reef. I have not had squids either. I've done none of that stuff or cuttlefish. I've not done any of those. Um, I've done seahorses. Uh, Gian, Giancarlo asks, what do I think of the Red Sea Reefer series? I gotta be honest, I think they're awesome. Uh, I love that everything's in a kit. I think, I mean, it's kind of funny. My brain thinks they are perfect for doctors, and I don't know why it has to be a doctor. Maybe because doctors are busy saving lives and don't have time to do a lot of research on aquarium needs. But the Red Sea Reefer series has everything in the package, basically, to get your reef up and running. And you basically add your rock and your water and your livestock, and you're in business. You know, everything fits together, everything, you know, the puzzle pieces are all there. I think it's a great setup, and I recommend it highly to people that are not wanting to do any homework, not wanting to find a piece from here and a piece from there, but they just want to combine it all into one. I think it's an awesome choice. Uh, Alexander says, at what point, you know, what, what size tank is it going to start affecting your, your home? Well, I, I would say that it's going to happen very quickly, and it, could, it just depends on the size of the room the tank is in. Like, if you had this massive, great room with a little bio cube in the corner that's 12 gallons that has a built-in lid, you probably wouldn't see anything. But my 29-gallon was affecting the wall behind it, and uh, there was a sump down beneath, and it was in a cabinet that I built myself, and I sealed it. I sealed the, uh, the woodwork like seven layers, you know, seven coats, trying to make sure that it would hold up. And that aquarium sat on that stand for four years and none of it eroded. I mean, it, it held up really well. From time to time, I go in and wipe things down. Um, I would spray it with furniture polish as needed, you know, to kind of make things look clean and shiny again. But I really sealed it in the first place to protect it from all that moisture that I knew was going to happen. But the wall behind it was definitely being affected, which is why I was suggesting some kind of a protection so you don't have to live through what I lived through. Uh, Rob, thank you very much. Yeah, I really love Minion. I've been running her now for about a year and a half, uh, maybe a little bit longer, and it's it's an ongoing learning process. It's it's not. You would think that you could just you've done it before. You can just do it again. It's like pulling the trigger on a circular saw. But no, there's so many things that can go wrong, <laughs> and there's you know it, there's a lot of puzzle pieces on the on the on the table when you're trying to run it, and just getting everything set up just right can be very frustrating. I had to cut out something quick yesterday. I said, oh, well, I'll cut out three. That way I'll have a couple for the future, you know. And they cut out the first one fine, and then the next two just basically moved, and I had to throw them away. It was a waste of time. At least I got the one I needed, but I would have liked to have done some pre-work. Oh, uh, speaking of covers, you know, covering your overflow box, I mentioned that about 15 minutes ago. I just wanted to show you an example of a cover that I make. So this, you know, I'll just peel off the protective paper. This is an overflow cover for an aquarium, and it's made of polycarbonate. So if you had an overflow in your tank that is this shape, the cover just sit on top, and that keeps fish from getting into the overflow box, it keeps algae from growing in the overflow box, and it doesn't warp. And you can use it this direction, and of course you can flip it over and you can use the other side. This is the same color on both sides, I, just pull, I didn't pull off the film off both sides. Uh, I like to keep them protected before I ship them out. Um, and I make, you know, different sizes for different uh, tanks. Uh, this is a $10 item if you need it. And uh, always make it out of black. So that way it's kind of invisible. So keeping those covers on your overflows will also keep the salt creep off your wall behind your aquarium. Any tips on getting rid of red planaria in a small 20-gallon tank? No fish, only LPS corals, and then two anemones. I've used flatworm exit, but they never go away. Well, if they are red planaria, then flatworm, flatworm exit should definitely do the job. Uh, you may have to do it two or three weeks in a row, like Sunday, 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 and that way you can eliminate them all. Uh, a trick that uh, we came up with a long time ago to use the right strength of flatworm exit is take <clears throat> a gallon of your tank water and put some of the flatworms in there and then add as many drops as it takes to that gallon to make them die. So if it took five drops to kill them, then you know you need five drops per gallon in your tank 
to kill off the rest of the red planaria. And uh, that, that's just the way to figure out the dosage that works for you. But you, you know, there's an article on my website, mealersreef.com slash flatworms, and you can just read that, and it, it explains exactly how to do it and get rid of them. But if you're not getting rid of them all, then do it again and do it again until they're gone. And I'm glad you have no fish in there because they get affected. But you know, as the flatworms die in the tank, they uh, affect the livestock, and especially the fish. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Dan asks, I, if I just bought a coral garden off of eBay, can I just stick it in my tank? Uh, I don't know. We don't know who made it, what it's made of, what, it, what is inside of it, what's inside the cement that held it together, if the paint is caustic or not, you know, if it's toxic. These are things, you know, we're pretty careful about what we put in our aquarium because we don't want to hurt the livestock. Uh, most of us tend to use rock that is, came from a reef originally. Um, of course, nowadays, a lot of people are using dry rock, but that was dug up from the earth that was originally a reef. Um, some people go to rock quarries looking for certain rocks they like. Uh, I had the question come up not too long ago saying, can I use lava rock? And I said, no. Um, typically, we don't know what's in lava rock. Uh, we do know that it was made from lava or it was volcanic in nature. It could have trace metals in it. It could affect your livestock. So I would not use that or recommend that. But um, no, decorations, we're really careful on decorations, what we put in our tanks, because it has to be made of inert items. And if there's anything in there that's toxic, it's going to affect your system to some degree. Uh, by the way, I wanted to mention that uh, last week I had a couple of people contact me saying, how's the microphone working out? And uh, one person said that it cut out seven different times. And then uh, a closer friend of mine said, Mark, your notifications were very likely coming on because it would cut out for like that half a second like you were getting a notification. So I went uh, into my settings today to turn off all of that. So hopefully this is coming through clean and it's not cutting in and out. Um, I'm planning to use this microphone set up at Macna and you know, I'll be around all kinds of equipment that's running and who knows, uh, but I'm hoping to get clean recordings for you guys. Uh, Sean Johnson asks, how can I protect the wall behind my aquarium in my apartment? And I mentioned before you could use a sticky contact paper that you put on the wall behind the aquarium. You could mount some type of clear plastic on the wall behind it with a couple of screws. Um, it doesn't have to be rock solid. It just needs to not fall down. And if you can just mount that in a way where it's mostly invisible, that would be your best bet. And it's something that you can clean off occasionally and you know later when you remove it, the wall behind the aquarium is completely intact. Uh, Rich asks me, what am I most excited about at Macna? Uh, I love the equipment. I am a huge equipment junkie. I like to see what's the latest. I like to see my friends and what new thing they've created or they've uh, generated. And I'm always wanting to see what they're going to show us next. So it, it used to be all the big reveals were at Macna every year, but now things are being revealed at Reef of Palooza. Reef of, things are being revealed via YouTube. They're being revealed uh, in live streams on Facebook, so it's kind of changed the dynamic a little bit. But I also get to see all my friends that I talk to all year long through Instant Messenger or uh, through Facebook. I get to see them in person, and we get to hang out for hours on end, and we get to hang out in, in the evenings down at the bar, and we go to parties. And it's just a great time to catch up with all my friends that I've been making you know, since 2002. And you'd think I've gone to every single Macna since 2002, never missed a single one. And I can't even imagine missing it. I mean, I just, it makes no sense to me because it's so much fun. Was I hating on Neptune? What did I say? Um, okay. So Mateus is saying they had the worst week of his life. His tank crashed, sort of, and half my acros are dead. The worst was the loss of a multi-branched Walt Disney coral, which really sucks. And yeah, I totally agree. That's a very slow-growing coral. Ah, all right, uh, let's switch topics to that about crashes because that's actually been on my mind quite a bit, but I didn't really know how to address it. But since you bring it up, I'm going to go ahead and run with it. 
Number one, anything at any time can go wrong can kill your tank. So I'm always thinking ahead of what I need to do next to prevent the possibility of something going wrong. And I will give you an example of something that I have avoided, like the plague, um, because of all the crashes that I used to read about back in 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006, 2007, 2008. Those first six or seven years online, I read so many uh, posts on, on uh, the forums where people complained that their tank crashed because they dumped all their Kalkwasser into their tank. Kalkwasser is a way of maintaining alkaline and calcium in your aquarium, but it's super dangerous stuff because it has a pH of 12. And if it's just dripping in a little tiny bit, totally safe. If it all goes in at once, destroys your reef crashes your tank. The entire tank looks white and milky. Everything inside is dying. You can't even see what you're trying to rescue because you can't see through the water. Kalkwas are super dangerous, so I don't use it. And yet, I know people that swear by it. They love it. Um, it's inexpensive. They use pickling lime, and they make their own, and they just mix it up with water, you know, with RODI water, and then they use it for top-off, or they use it to increase their pH on their tank, and they swear by it. But the risk factor is so high that I would never use it that way. If I was going to do Kalkwasser on my own tank, I would handle it just like I handle my dehumidifier. Remember I told you, I turn it on at night and in the morning it's off. If I was gonna do Kalkwasser on my tank and I was gonna put in, let's say, a gallon of Kalkwasser a day, I would mix up a gallon and then I would drip that into my tank until the jug was empty and that would be it, until the next time I mix up a jug. And that way it could never dump in five, 10, 15, 20 gallons of Kalkwasser into my tank and kill my livestock. So that is an example of me avoiding what was a very well-known, documented way of crashing your tank, and it still happens to this day. There's still people that crash their tanks with Kalkwasser. There is a risk that something can go wrong. And usually what happens is the protein skimmer goes crazy, and it's dumping all this liquid, so the top off is adding all this new Kalkwasser in, and it, it's just raising the pH higher and higher and higher. And if you buffer your tank to raise pH, and you have SPS corals, then you've probably seen on occasion when you've buffered too much and your pH was 8.6, 8.7, and the SPS corals are like letting streamers come off of it. It's stressed and it's releasing all this mucus into the water. That's because the pH is too high. Well, now I said 8.7, imagine 12, much too high. So we wanna avoid anything that can crash our tank. This time of year, another thing that happens to tanks, and I watched this on another channel recently, uh, Prestige Reef was talking about crashing his tank. His, his aquarium got too hot, and he couldn't cool it off. And I think he was on vacation at the same time, or coming back from vacation, and so his reef ran way too hot, and it crashed his tank, and he lost livestock, he lost fish. Um, the hotter the water becomes in your tank, um, and I mean 85, 86, 87 Fahrenheit, the oxygen level plummets and the fish start being oxygen deprived and your fish die. And as your fish die, the ammonia goes up. And as ammonia releases in the tank, it starts killing other things. And it's a cascading crash. So we want to avoid anything that can crash your tank. So keeping your, your home cool, keeping your tank cool is very important. And you need to have something set up to cool your tank. Now, uh, I'm just going to mention a few things. A chiller is something you can plug in and it'll cool the water in the tank as the room gets hotter and hotter. You can uh, f float frozen blocks of ice in your tank. Like if you had a 29 gallon or a 55 gallon or a 90 gallon, you could float a frozen two liter bottle in your tank and you could have more two liter bottles sitting in the freezer and you're constantly swapping them out. Worst case scenario, you go to the supermarket or to your local convenience store and you get the big five pound bag of ice or 10 pound bag of ice and you put that in your tank, right in the bag. I wouldn't even open the bag. I would, maybe you'd even wrap it a second time, but clean off the bag because you don't know what's on the outside of the plastic. Just make sure it's clean before you put it in your tank so you don't pollute your tank. And use that to cool your tank and yank it out and put a new bag in to bring the temperature down. These are some tricks you can do when you're in a worst case scenario. But ideally, cool the room that the tank is in will help immensely. If your house is 90 or 100 degrees and your tank is you know, rising quickly, doesn't matter how much ice you're throwing in there, odds are you're, uh, it's, it's just not gonna work out because the room is too hot that the tank is sitting in. So avoid that. 
Uh, I'm going to go on record, and I know that this is screaming at Murphy's Law to come get me now, but in 20 years, I've never had a crash. I've always tried to prepare for worst case scenario. I know that it's not 100% bulletproof. I know that there's always one way something can go wrong, but for the most part, I've never had a crash. I've never lost half my livestock to a crash. It's um, always been some little minor thing that I was able to handle. So I definitely would recommend you look really closely at your system and see what you can do to avert disaster. Ah, uh, yeah, thank you for mentioning that. If you're enjoying these live streams, hit the like button. If you have something to say, comment on it. <laughs> uh, Jessica says, you should do a Nemo tank. Well, right over there, I have an anemone cube that's got 14 clownfish in it. I'll turn this slightly. It's right over there, 60 gallons, and it's tied into the same sump that this reef is on, and so it's full of clownfish and anemones. That's all right. You know what? Uh, maybe I shouldn't have said it, you know, tempting Murphy's Law, but at the same time, it is true. Uh, I've been either lucky or I've been successful, <laughs> or both. But eventually something's going to happen. It happens to all of us. You know, I, I've, I've been around this hobby a long time. I've seen a lot of things happen. But I am happy that uh, I've had a good run. And I, I hope that I can keep it going for another 20 years without a crash. The hottest my house temperature has gotten to internally was around, I think, 82 or 83 degrees. And that was about two months ago when they came out here to work on the AC because it had gone out again. And I just turned off the lights on my tank that day. And I had an air conditioner in that room, the, the kind that rolls around, and it was blowing cold air onto the tank. So that was my way of combating it, and the tank didn't even skip a beat. It didn't even know. I don't think you need to freeze salt water in your two-liter bottle. I don't think it's necessary because the bottle is sealed. Uh, you just want to freeze the water. Make sure you leave a little bit of space in there for expansion as it's freezing solid. You don't want the bottle to burst inside your freezer. But having two-liter bottles of... Uh, Anything, you know, even if you have a small tank, you can get 20 ounce bottles. You can do one liter bottles, uh, Gatorade bottles, just whatever. Uh, just something that's solid and frozen and can melt slowly and help keep your aquarium temperature down is what I would recommend. And yes, of course, you can use fans to cool the tank too. But again, if the room is 95 degrees or whatever, you're gonna have a problem. I like to keep my house around 72 degrees and uh, that makes me feel comfortable. 73, 74, 75, I start feeling a little sticky don't like that. Uh, and uh, the dehumidifier is very important too. Uh, I was complaining to my buddy that my AC, I thought it wasn't working right. And this was before there was actually a problem. And he said, you need to run your dehumidifier because I was feeling cold and clammy and it made no sense because the temperature was what I'm always keeping the house at. And once I took the moisture out of the air, it felt comfortable in here again. So I, I am very interested in keeping things comfortable. Um, someone just asked if I will be at Reefa Palooza in 2019. I think I will, because I have not been to that one in New York, so I'd like to attend it. And, you know, everyone was asking about me this year, and I apologize. I just got back from two back-to-back -back trips, had to get home and work on some stuff for my customers, and I had to kind of, like, reset and take care of my tank, of course. So I didn't go. I will be at Reefa Palooza in California in October, so uh, you can look for me there. Of course, I'll be at Macna in September. I'm going to be at Aquashella in, I guess, two weeks. So that'll be taking place in uh, Chicago. So if you haven't looked up Aquashella yet, make sure you do that. Uh, Jeff Robinson says, how often do you perform maintenance on your tank equipment? Um, hmm. At least twice a year. Some things are more frequent. The skimmer gets completely cleaned about two times a year, where I literally take it out, put it outside, soak it in vinegar, let it run overnight, and then I disassemble it and I clean everything and then I put it all back together and I clean out the sump where the skimmer was sitting and I reinstall it and fire it up. And it looks amazing. Brand new skimmers, ugh. I wish the bubbles looked like that all the time. On a brand new clean skimmer in my sump, it looks like milk in there because it's just like a billion tiny bubbles. I love that. Uh, right now, you know, it's doing fine. But the outside of my skimmer right now is just covered in these white, hard tube feather duster looking things. And uh, people have come over and it's like, wow, look at that. And they stop to take pictures because they find it so fascinating. And it makes it really hard to pick up that skimmer because <laughs> everything's so pointy and pokey. But uh, so yeah, the skimmer twice a year. Uh, the Vortec pumps get pulled off about every two to three months. 
There's an MP60 right there. It's got bubble algae in it. So I need to take off those two and clean them. I actually have a third one that's clean. So I would install a clean one there, take the dirty one out and soak it in vinegar overnight. Then the next day, clean it and then put that one in on the other one and remove that one and soak it. And then once it's cleaned, it goes on the shelf. And then I've got an MP40 over here that needs to be cleaned. And I've got an MP40 on the anemone cube that has to be cleaned. I've got an MP10 on the 60 gallon frag system that has to be cleaned. The maintenance pump, or I'm sorry, the, the maintenance for the pumps themselves, like the return pumps, I clean those, I don't know, once a year, maybe a little longer. Depends how, um, how much free time I have. Okay, uh, <laughs> that's a good question. Kier asks, uh, he's thinking about getting a yellow chorus wrasse, and how will that affect his, uh, his snail population? And that is a funny story. I've got a yellow course in here swimming around, over there. And I bought two of them. And this is like the fourth yellow course I've purchased in all the years I've been in the hobby. So I bought two of them like a year ago. And they were swimming together all the time. I, I was sure they were a mated pair. And all of a sudden, I just have one. I never saw the body. I'm blaming Taco here. Which, uh, I think that's what I'm gonna call my enemy. I'm gonna call it taco. <laughs> I think it ate it because I have no body, no evidence, nothing on the floor. It's just a missing fish, hasn't shown up in the sump. So, but uh, I had a very large yellow course in my last tank and somebody said, that doesn't affect your snails? I'm like, no, he's awesome. And right as I said that, before my very eyes, he went, pow and hit a snail and the guy was like see and i was like wow i've never seen that happen i can't believe that just happened so uh they can eat some snails they can be opportunistic hunters if you have snails that have fallen to the bottom of the tank and they're facing upward they're open to anything hermit crabs can get them other fish can get them uh, worms can get them starfish can get them uh, so yeah flip your snails right side over get them back on the glass where they belong put them on the rock in a good spot you know, that kind of thing. But I wouldn't sit there and say, don't get a yellow chorus wrasse. That's actually a great fish for pest control because they eat nudibranchs, they eat flatworms, they, they eat pods, you know, they, 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 go in, they go in the nooks and crannies. And I love itty bitty tiny ones because they fit into the coral colonies. Once you have a big fish, they're basically gonna wait for the food you drop in the top of the tank once a day. And they're gonna um, not be nearly as helpful. Uh, Hyper Assault asks, how do you get your corals to open up? Well, I don't put my hand in the tank, and I let things happen naturally. Uh, you have to realize when you're looking at your tank, it might be early in the morning, it might be late at night, it might be that you missed it when the corals were wide open. But typically, the corals open up during the lighting period, and usually are at their fullest size around the six or seven hour mark, and then they start to contract again and get ready for the night. They may open up for food in the tank, you know, they might get really reactive to sensing the food in the water, and you might see your LPS corals really opening wide to hopefully capture some food. Or you may even see the coral inhaling the food and bringing it into its mouth. And you know that's always a treat to watch. But they don't stay open all the time. They, they get smaller at night, of course, just like any other thing would do. Have I ever had pyramid snails? Um, I think you're talking about the pyrams, the ones that go on the side of clams and bore their way in. I did have them on a clam of my own once, and I came across them on some of the snails that I had, and the yellow coarse wrasse took care of them. And the ones that the ras didn't get, I scraped off with a toothpick. So I just removed it and got them out of the tank. Big Salty, uh, I feel like there's something missing in that sentence. I'm trying to read it. With all the de decreased water change schedule due to dosing, was wondering if not siphoning sand affects the tank, or is it better to stick with water changes and forget about dosing? All right, I, not sure I quite got that, but I'm gonna do my best to answer that question. You dose what the tank needs. The water change is used to export uh, the, the the nitrate in the water to export any, you know, I mean, think about it. You, your tank is constantly doing the ANN cycle, ammonia, nitrite, nitrate. And so it's converting ammonia to nitrate as quickly as possible. That's completely normal in a reef tank, and this happens all the time. 
we never really measure an ammonia level in our tanks, but we always measure some form of nitrate. And so water changes decrease the nitrate. It also helps decrease some of the phosphate level. The bigger the water change, the more of this you're getting out of the system. And as you're bringing in new salt water, you're bringing in cleaner water. It's just like bringing in fresh air into your home after you've had a lot of stuff going on in here, like you're painting, uh, you're, you're cooking food in the kitchen, there's a lot of smoke in the house. You open the windows, you're bringing the fresh air and gets all that smoky and all the fumes out. Same principle. But um, dosing is really important if you're keeping corals. If you're a fish-only system, dosing is probably not going to be necessary at all. Your alkaline and calcium magnesium levels don't really matter. But when it comes down to uh, your, your reef tank and you're trying to keep this type of stuff alive, you're going to want to maintain those parameters with some very specific additives, which is going to be alkalinity and calcium and magnesium being dosed constantly. And so in the old days, calcium reactors were what you used for the alkaline and calcium. And the magnesium you dose separately. And then um, now everyone's using two and three part liquid additives and they're using dosing pumps to add it instead. And uh, that's another method of adding, but they're adding it every single day. They might be adding it multiple times a day because the tank is absorbing it and you have to replace it. But um, if you're not doing as many water changes, like let's say you're relying on the refugium to handle the nitrate and possibly help reduce the phosphate levels, they're not gonna add any alkalinity or calcium magne magnesium. They are literally just working on exporting. And of course, you have to pull the plants out and throw them away or give them to other people so that the refugium keeps growing more. If you just let it grow and fill, it becomes stagnant. Uh, and I don't mean water not moving through it. I mean, it's no longer pulling things out of the water because it's just a brick of plant. So you've got to cull some of the plant, which could be 25% of whatever's in there once a month. Okay. What was this about a four foot fish? Hang on. Okay, Dustin Clemens asked an interesting question and uh, I'll tell you up front, no. By removing your sump entirely and taking it outside to clean it, will it crash your tank? No. Uh, what'll happen is while you're cleaning your sump out, this is still gonna be running. It just won't be draining down into a sump. And then when you reinstall your sump and you put your skimmer back in there and you put your heaters back in there and you put your reactor back in there and you put your return pump in there and you fill it up with salt water and you turn it on, that also should not crash your tank. As long as your pH, your temperature, and your salinity match, it shouldn't affect anything at all. The area of the refugium, if you were to muck that all up and then you try and restart it, you might cause a little bit of chaos, but it really shouldn't. I have a video on my channel about how to wash the sand, you know, that you use sand that's in your system, and I did a demonstration of my refugium, and I took out all the sand out of here, which is a four inch sand bed, you know, 52 inches long. I took it all out, washed it all out, and put it all back in, turned the system back on, and the tank never even skipped a beat. Okay, a lot of people are doing the Triton method, which is what I think we were referring to before, about the decrease or the lack of water changes entirely. And those people that are doing the Triton method are literally adding additives on a regular basis. And not just the big three. They're adding other things that Triton recommends because you send in your water for an analysis and then they say you need iron and you need this and you don't need that and you want to get rid of this. And they give you a whole list of things to add to help balance out all the ions in your tank and get everything just right. Hyper Assault asks, how do you raise your pH? Um, number one, I don't recommend you even think about your pH, but I understand the question. And ideally, we want to have a tank that is running between 8.1 to 8.3. But that being said, I've seen beautiful reef tanks that are running 7.7 .7 to 7.9 on a daily basis. So pH is not really so critical unless it's quite low and your corals are faded and miserable looking and just don't seem to perk up. And if that's the case, you need to find out why the pH is so low. Odds are alkalinity, calcium, and magnesium are not correct, and that's why pH isn't correct. So get those three fixed first, and your pH should take care of itself. Um, Haeckel asks, uh, is a sulfur reactor a better choice or a biopellet reactor? 
I would probably lean to the sulfur reactor being more effective than a biopellet reactor, but you need to follow the guidelines very, very carefully with it when you're running it. If you have to raise your pH on your um, aquarium, uh, same person asking a continuous question, then what I would use is soda ash to bring it up, but it will affect your alkalinity. So you've got to keep measuring your alkalinity to make sure you're not raising it too high. Sean asks, do you let sunlight hit your tank? Um, either indirectly or directly. Okay, so there are some people that actually have what are called solar tubes over their aquarium, and it's a big metal tube that goes straight up to the roof. It's got a dome on top, and sunlight ricochets down the tube and actually lights the tank instead of using artificial lighting. So that does work. Um, but typically, that kind of lighting is not guaranteed lighting because of weather. And it's so uh, you may get really bright middle of the day light, and then you'll have dim light, or you'll have the... Uh, Cloud cover affects the lighting. So I would say in that regard, I mean, there are people that have done it, and their tanks weren't algae-free. I kind of feel like those tanks lean toward getting a little bit of extra algae they don't really want, but they can't control how much light their tank's getting because it's just happening. With our situation with artificial, we can control the lighting a little bit more specifically, plus you can control your phosphate levels, and you can control your cleanup crew size, and all those things in conjunction work together and they keep your algae at bay. But can sunlight hit your tank directly and not hurt it? It can. And early in the morning, the sun is shining through my patio doors, and they hit the reef, and they hit the anemone cube a little bit for a brief duration, 30 minutes maybe, tops. And it's not doing anything weird. So yes, you can do it. But for the most part, we try to avoid it just because of nuisance algae. Okay, big salty, uh, we're getting back to your topic about limited water changes, and I see you were saying, uh, but wouldn't affecting, wouldn't, okay, let me just read it. I'm more focused on most people don't do as many water changes now because of doing, because of dosing, but how does not siphoning the sand bed affect the tank if everything else is stable? Um, okay, it's kind of a double topic. This sand bed has never been siphoned. And it is, this tank's been running for four years, coming up on nine months, so almost five years old. And the sand bed is the sand bed. I don't siphon it. Uh, I have siphoned the anemone cube because so many fish, very small body of water, limited amount of, sol uh, of sand. That one, it's like a one and a half inch sand bed. This one's a four inch sand bed. And in that one, I pulled out a lot of detritus because of all those fish. I'm feeding those clowns, and those clowns are pooping and that sand tends to look dirty to me. But for the most part with deep sand beds, we don't siphon our sand bed at all. We just leave it alone. The top half inch is where all the life is, and we don't really want to suck that out. And when I've had to break down big tanks like this one, which I've had to do, and I've had to break down the 280, which was one foot less long than this tank, um, after you know that tank been running for six years, when I took the sand bed out, it was dirty sand, but it wasn't like black sulfuric, you know, lethal stuff which was great because I was very curious, what am I going to find when I start taking all the rock out? What's it going to be down deep? And it was nothing. And I think that's because I have really good flow and I have a good cleanup crew that's constantly keeping the sand clean. How do you deal with, what did it say? I jumped. Uh, Manuel says, how do you deal with saltwater evaporation ruining your walls, your drywall? That I talked about in the beginning of this video, so I'm just going to tell you, protect the wall in the first place before it ever happens. And you can see that when you play back this video later, it's in the first 10 minutes of the discussion. Murtaza asks, how does a walking dendro grow? I do not know because I've never kept one that long. The one I had seemed to be the same size all the time. Pedro says, what is the most expensive mistake you ever made? Well, how about if I just tell you the worst mistake I ever made rather than the most expensive because I don't put a price on livestock. Um, the worst mistake I ever made, I think was in 2006, maybe 2007. And I had sun corals in the bottom of my tank and every night I would feed them. And one night, 
I put the food on the top of the tank to melt, you know, to thaw out. It was mysis and uh, cyclopes, and I was going to feed the sun corals, and I turned off all the pumps. I got distracted, and I said, wow, I'm really tired. I'm going to go to bed. And I went to sleep with all my pumps off, and I woke up the next morning, and half of my fish were dead. And that was completely my fault. I mean, there was nothing that they did wrong. And, it, I mean, I woke up, and the water was down two inches, and I thought, that's weird. And then I realized what I did, and all my beautiful fish were lying on the sand. I mean, it like they died like 10 minutes before I woke up. It was like they tried to survive. And half the fish lived, you know, but they were miserable for the first hour or so until the oxygen levels rose. Biggest mistake ever made, and I've never made that mistake twice. I set timers for everything now. So if I do anything, I tell my watch, you know, set this timer. You know, I just, hey Siri, set the timer. And uh, she just does it. <laughs> she was trying just now. Um, so I do that all the time to remind me, as soon as the timer goes off, I go deal with that thing. I don't sit there and say, okay, I'll get that in a minute, because then I forget, and you know, whatever happens, happens. So I'm always on top of that. That was a horrible mistake. I was really upset about it. Let's see. Yeah, as the gobies that are in the lower part of the sand, but they'll clean your sand as well. But if I had any, like a blue jaw or a, a blue spot goby or a sleeper head goby or any of those, they would cover these corals constantly. They'd just be dead. So I don't like this type of fish in my tank, but they might be perfect for you. And uh, it really comes down to choice of what kind of livestock you're keeping. If you're really good about keeping all your corals on the rock work, you can have all the gobies you want down here doing their thing. Okay, we're, we're going in over an hour. I gotta end this, I gotta wrap this up. Let's see what else I can answer here really quick. Uh, don't know how to say this name, but the question is, do you believe, do you think external reactor types, you know, like the algae reactors are a good thing? I think that these algae reactors, we're basically talking about a cylinder with light either going around it or a light going down the center. Um, why can't I think of the name of it? Uh, Pax Bellum, they were the ones that came out with the prototype and the patent on that uh, item. I think it's a really cool idea, and it's especially great for someone that cannot run a refugium. But uh, I, discover, I talked to someone recently who bought one of those, and they ran it, and it didn't work for them. So I, I have a feeling it's one of those things that this will work for some people, not work for others, but it isn't a guarantee. And I would love to follow, let's say, six people. I'd love, you know, let's just say we can find six people that are running the algae reactors and month after month after month after month, it works perfectly. I'd like to hear that. Because what it seems to me, and I could be wrong, and I'm not throwing anyone under the bus, I just don't know. But it seems like I hear good results on the first month. Like everyone sets one up and it works. But I don't hear it consistently keep working. So I would like to hear from someone, or maybe BRS Investigates will do it at some point, where they say, here, we've done it for nine months in a row, and we have nine months of proof. You know, I would love to see that because I think it, it's a really cool idea. <laughs> Can too many water changes be bad for reef tank? Nope. But uh, for reef tanks, the general rule is 25% once a month. Uh, if you want to do it smaller, you want to do daily water changes instead, and you know, little smaller portions to make your life easy, you can do that as well. But unlike freshwater, where they change water every single week, we don't have to do that. We can do it once a month. And this tank hasn't had a water change in probably 10 months. The three things that are important in a water change are going to be temperature, salinity, and pH. And pH could be uh, replaced with alkalinity. You want to make sure that those three match. On the, your new salt water should match the same as the tank. I know we do need to clean our skimmers regularly, but how often do you clean vinegar soak the skimmer pump? The, that's the one I do twice a year. So I take the entire skimmer with its pumps and I put it outside in a big vat of salt, of salt water, of vinegar water, and I let it run. I just plug it in and let it run in vinegar water and overflow for an entire night. And that way the next day everything's softened up, it's easy to take it apart, scrape it clean, get a brand new looking, reassemble it, bring it back in and hook it up. 
And so that would include the pumps. Um, all right, uh, let's talk about Mateus for a second here. My goal is to increase growth and get a more yellowish 65K or 6500 Kelvin spectrum. My current LEDs can't support the high par lower Kelvin. Uh, I just want to try out the hal halide technology. Uh, Mateus, if you're going to do uh, metal halides, then I would say copy me. And I use 10,000 Kelvin, 20,000 Kelvin. Um, if you are already running LEDs that are doing the 20K, and you're happy with that blue light and you just want to do some daylight, get yourself some 10K bulbs. I think that the 6500 will drive you nuts. 6500 is what my refugium is under. And that one is uh, more yellow. Here, I'll show it to you. Oops. So that should be adjusting here in a second. That's the yellow color versus the reef above, which is 10K, 20K lighting. This is 10K over here right now. Um, this is going to be some 10, some 20, and then this is all 20 on this side. And this is all 10K down here. And right here is a little tiny clownfish in an anemone. Right. But I don't think you'll like the look of 6,500 Kelvin in your tank. People did do that in the past. They were trying to grow corals uh, quickly. You know, I'm talking about 15 years ago. They would grow them really, really fast under 6,500 Kelvin and uh, very, very yellow light and they'd get big corals, and then they'd put them under a 20K radium uh, and let that cook those corals for about two months with a lot of blue, and that would make them colorful, and then they could sell them. But uh, it just depends what you're trying to accomplish. If you're just trying to grow pretty corals in your tank, an hour and a half, two hours of 10K lighting is great, and then switch to the 20K for the rest of the day. That's basically what I'm doing with my reef. Okay. I don't see any more questions. I'm going to end this because we're already at 310. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, there will be a live stream next week. And uh, I'm dropping a new video uh, on my channel earlier, uh, later on this week, so you have something to look forward to. And uh, I look forward to all your comments. So if you're enjoying the channel, please hit subscribe. We are definitely growing. We've picked up another five or 600 people in the last week. So welcome to the channel, and I really appreciate you guys watching. And I hope that today's discussion helps protect your house from any kind of wear and tear.